Christmas. <laughs> Oh, let's see. Smackdown. Hey, uh, you guys that are in the chat thing, um, if I sound shitty, let me know. I, uh, I'm, I'm currently using the, uh, the regular internet connection, but I could switch over to the better stuff. I think I welcome know. everybody to permaculture smackdown today we're going to talk about appropriate technology and specifically a course that is happening over at weed and labs and kind of what we're thinking about or what possibly could go into an appropriate technology course and uh, my name is Josiah Wallingford with Permethos, and my co-host is Paul Wheaton from permies.com yes yes <laughs> so welcome everybody so Paul we have, uh, there's a lot to talk about with, uh, let's just first of all talk about what is appropriate technology? Why is this uh, even, what, like, is this a, a course? Is this, um, what, what exactly is appropriate technology and why is this important? I would say that appropriate technology is going to be uh, uh, stuff, I mean, we're trying to move away from things that, that we know are toxic, right? And so it's like, how do we, how do we reduce the toxicity in our greater world? And I think appropriate technology is in large, a large part about that. So a lot of it comes from energy. So for example, a rocket mass heater would be appropriate technology. Um, it's gonna dramatically reduce our energy footprint. Um, uh, but we could also talk about like, uh, all right, uh, uh, drying food. You know, if you, wanna, if you wanna do food preservation, there's a, a variety of different ways to preserve your food, but, um, you know, the way like, like the, the people that lived in, in where I'm sitting right now, 500 years ago, uh, the big thing that they did was drying food. So it's like, okay, uh, well, they would just like find a bunch of rocks and set their food out on rocks because the sun had been hitting the rocks so much that those rocks are pretty sterile from UV radiation. And then they would lay stuff out on the rocks and it would dry. Now, if it didn't dry fast enough, it'd go bad. And so then um, what we can do and what we have done, for example, at the appropriate technology course here last year is we built a solar food dehydrator. And uh, hopefully, you know, it dries much faster. Not only does it use the mighty power of the sun, but it kind of gets an airflow going through that's a pretty strong flow. And it kind of uh, blows warm air onto the food um, and, and dries it that way. Now, some people, have elected to buy food dehydrators. So they got them set up in their home, they plug them in, and it makes your electric bill go up like $900 a month. Yeah. Um, and, and some of you might be thinking like $900 a month, I must be exaggerating. And it's kind of like, in fact, hey, uh, the people that uh, you know, are, are typing in our stuff, uh, how much have you guys spent in a month of electricity of trying to drive food? I'm sure like most of the people watching this right now have spent a bunch of money trying to drive food at some point, you know, and it's, it's significant. $900 a month, I think, is probably maybe a little on the high end, but I'll bet, I'll bet nearly everybody that's done it has had a month where it's like, holy shit. <laughs> yeah, you're running, especially if you're running like a high end food dehydrator. You're talking about uh, providing electricity for heat, so like an electric oven, and electricity for a fan, and then the electricity for like the control panel stuff. And so um, the big one, of course, is the heat. That's the huge cost. And then the fan as well. Uh, that's a cost. So yeah, it adds up, especially if you get into winter months. If you're trying to dehydrate food in the winter, which most people aren't, but if you are, that's when the electric bill is really high. Uh, and if you go off solar, of course, that's also when it's most draining on your solar power. Well, if you've got electric heat in your house and you've got uh, a food dehydrator um, and you're running that in your house, I mean, basically you're running it for free. Right. You know, because if it's, if you've got like electric baseboard heat, then it's, it might be using like, uh, you know, it, it might be doing $150 worth of heat that month. And then uh, if you run your uh, uh, 
electric food dehydrator, then um, the whole house is warm the same and then the heater never comes on. So you might put 150 bucks into the, uh, into the food dehydrator for electricity and then you put your baseboard heat never even comes on. And so yeah. free, but uh, okay. you, I think okay. the problem with what you're saying though is, is that usually you're dry in food in the fall. Yeah. And, and uh, um, yeah. So it would be good to get a, a food dehydrator that might be solar part-time and, you know, could have a rocket boost as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I would say along with appropriate technology, there's appropriate use. So, for example, with a food dehydrator, you wouldn't need – there's some herbs you don't need that much power to dehydrate herbs. On, on, like most herbs, they're fairly thin. If you just put them in like a heated room – on drying racks on like screens big screens that's probably going to do the job just fine you don't need the fan and the uh, the super dehydrating but if you're talking about fruits and meats that's when you really want to get a food dehydrator something that's going to really crank out the heat and uh and and the air movement the airflow so just real quick i see that uh one of the people that is our in our chat thing here is Alan Booker. He is um, the primary instructor for our PDC this year, our, our uh, Homesteaders PDC. And, um, and of course, we're talking about the appropriate technology course that we're going to do this year. And a lot of people, um, what they do is they come to both because we've set up the PDC and the ATC back to back because in our past, that's been what people wanted. Mm -hmm. um, so like I think about two thirds to three quarters of the students do both. So they're here for a full four weeks. Um, and I, I kind of feel like, uh, I, and, you know, maybe, maybe next week what we ought to do is uh, make it be a show where Alan Booker fires up his camera and he's on here too. I was just um, going to say, Alan, if you want, we can throw you in now. Are you, are you presentable? <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Uh, there was a movie once where, the, where they said, are you presentable? And they go in, the guy's naked. And he says, yeah, I'm presentable. And he's naked. And it says, I thought you said you were presentable. I am. And I'm also naked. <laughs> so um, uh, I, I think one, a, a couple of quick notes uh, for the stuff. He says, oh, I'm actually at work listening as I'm setting up a router configuration. Okay, so he's not available. But uh, quick notes. Uh, we've only got two weeks left in the peasant PDC early bird price stuff. So if any of you are thinking of coming, and I should say uh, at the same time or a little bit surrounding that time, we're gonna, we have something we've set up called the 2018 Brown and Purple Schmoozeroo at Allerton Abbey. And we've already got several people say that they're coming to that. And for the um, PD, yeah, you're coming to this. And, uh, and we've got several people, uh, uh, we've sold several tickets to the Peasant PDC already. Still tickets available for the Peasant PDC. Um, and uh, I'm kind of, so I'm hoping that we're going to get like 40 people that, that come to the Peasant PDC. And then the schmoozeroo happens for like uh, five and a half weeks or so. But it's kind of like, come on by for two days, come on by for a week. If anybody who's ever been here before, it's free. It's totally free. Come on down. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, some people that are coming will, might, might teach some stuff to some other people. Uh, some people are just going to watch the clouds pass and visit with folk. And that's it. That's cool. That's fine. Uh, uh, hopefully, I mean, I got the impression that some people, of course, are like powerful food pushers and they're planning on feeding people. But it's like a feed yourself kind of a thing. There's no guarantee. But I think for the schmoozeroo that uh, some people will come like for three days at the beginning. Other people might come for two weeks in the middle. Some people might uh, uh, come for all of it. So you're saying my audio is cutting out? Well, it did for me. Uh, so I'm, I, was, I was asking if anybody else was experiencing that so I can know if it's me not here. Okay. So, okay. So, so it's, it's your problem, not my problem. <laughs> all right. Yeah. I got I to gotta, I gotta learn how to do this better. It's your problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. So uh, uh, the Smoojeru is that after? That's after the, the. So there's the peasant PDC, then the PDC, then the ATC, and it's after that. No, it's happening at the same time as the peasant PDC. 
Because oh, okay. the, the idea is, is that the peasant PDC is, we, it's super cheap. Like right now for the early bird price, it's 480 bucks. Yeah. And so it's kind of like, uh, um, the, but the thing is that the format of it is that you spend half a day each day in the classroom and then half a day each day doing hands-on stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, so what we're saying is that people in the schmooze roo are welcome to join for the hands-on portion of whatever's going on. Or the people in the schmooze roo can make sure that their lawn chair is working correctly and, you know, it's shifted to point at the sun so they could work on their tan. <laughs> uh, you know, stuff like that. Uh, um, so I think, oh, and, and uh, uh, I know Julia has said that she's going to be there. Um, uh, but all right, the, the, the thing is, is that it's... Um, Maybe a little bit, I mean, because what do you want to do? When you want to go to a permaculture event, part of it is, is that you want to go hang out with a bunch of other permaculture people, right? Yeah, yeah. And so then uh, for one part of it, there's definitely going to be a whole bunch of permaculture people there for the peasant PDC. And it's a, the idea with the peasant PDC is it's a much looser format. And so it's a lot more forgiving. And then it's like, okay, when they're doing their hands-on portion, you can go and be elbow to elbow with them. But if hands-on stuff is like, oh, I don't want to do that, not a problem. Just sit back, watch the clouds pass. And then um, whenever meals are going on, they're all cooking their own meals. You could cook your own meal too. Maybe you're going to cook it with them, but you can hang out with them with, around the campfire and visit and whatnot. Yeah, so. it's, it's making me think of like if I was going on a, on a, um, a cruise, like I'm going to go on a permaculture cruise in Montana and just hang out with a bunch of people that are into permaculture. Sounds like fun to me. Yeah, so um, we just dreamt this up uh, yet yesterday. Yeah, it was yesterday. It was me and Jocelyn and Fred, you know, got the idea of like schmoozeroo. And so um, uh, totally eminent. And it seems like um, we've already had several people. Uh, Zach Weiss says that uh, he's ho hoping to be by for like maybe a week um, as part of it. And uh, so when we're just getting started, we just got it announced. It hasn't even been out on the dailyish email yet. Um, so, yeah, I'm looking at probably a week or two. Um, I have to film some courses, so I'll be stopping by in between then. You know, I just, with all the, I mean, we've had hundreds of people who have stopped by here at one point or another. And so then all those people get to come for free. And then if there's anybody who wants to come, then it's like, it's the, uh, the gapper fee. So like if it's a family of five, then it's a hundred bucks for the first person and 20 bucks for each person after that. So that'd be 180 bucks for all five people. Um, and, uh, um, and this anyway. bring your own beer. I mean, food, right? Yeah. And if you're bringing beer, that's fine. Just, um, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to request what I requested all events now, a, Whatever container you brought it in, pack it out with you. Um, if, if you're flying in and out or taking the bus or whatever, then just take your bottles or cans or whatever to the local recycling on the way. Um, and then, of course, I also want to request, not going to require it, but I'm going to request, go easy on the hooch. <laughs> we, we've just had, we've had, like, uh, this last PDC went smoothly hooch-wise. Um, but... Every PDC, every PDC previous to that, we had an alcohol-related nightmare. And, and it's like, um, oh, jeez. So I'm, I don't drink. You know? I'm just not into it. And, uh, nor do I do drugs. I'm just not into it. So it's and, not a five-week uh, like, party. There's no DJ. And so no meth is allowed. Uh, no cocaine. <laughs> no uh, what other drugs are but, there? But we allow, we allow people to have hooch because, you know, we're, we're like, it, for reasons, all right? We're just, we just allow it. But, um, holy shit, every fucking year, except for last year. Because last year, I got up in front of the crowd and said, okay, have your hooch. That's great. Just go easy on it, okay? And just quiet time helped a lot, too. Like, it's quiet hours at this time. Like, you need to shut the fuck up at, at this point. In the night. Yeah, because <laughs> not only are we going to tell you to shut the fuck up, but we're going to make sure that we're playing our music loud at 6 a.m., you know, next to you, wherever. We're going to find out where you're sleeping, and that's where we're playing the music. 
Um, anyway, the the the, the big okay. thing sounds like a ton of fun. Uh, yeah, I I think it's going to be really awesome. I think I'm hoping that for the schmoozeroo that we might have a total of 100 people pass through. But at any given time, there might only be like 20. And so, uh, you'll see me with my truck camper and some lawn chairs and some draft beers. Uh, <laughs> that's where you'll know I'm where I'm at. <laughs> and and if anybody's thinking of coming. You got to go to the Schmoozeroo thread at Permies and and say you don't have to commit. It's I mean it's totally squishy, and say I'm thinking of coming. And if you're thinking of coming and you want to bait people there, you might offer to say like I'm I'm willing to teach a blah 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 while I'm there, and I'm bringing cookies. I I don't know I you know, what whatever I'm might be teach how to make a beer kegerator. <laughs> <laughs> A solar beer kegerator. Uh, I'm kidding. I don't think I'm going to do that. Anyway, uh, okay. Right. So that sounds like a shitload of fun. Appropriate technology course is the focus. So you have, um, okay. So we've discussed what appropriate technology is. Basically, it's smart being smart about technology and how to use it. Well, so, and of course, all the other forms of technology, they all say that they're smart about that too. But it's okay. kind of like I think another part of it is is like you're on a homestead, you've got space. And it's like, what's, what's going to save you money? And uh, also, I think that there's a lot to be, a lot of times, I mean, I like what's, what's Jack's byline for his show, yeah, um, being prepared for when times get tougher, even if they don't. Yeah. And, and I think that's kind of smart. So like, if you've got a, a, a solar food dehydrator, it's totally passive. It doesn't require any electricity. And, uh, and it dries your food, which is a big homestead thing. Preserving your harvest is a big deal. And then, um, uh, so it does it with or without electricity. Um, so if anything happens, you've still got a way to be able to do that. And it's the best way. It saves you, I, it saves money just by knowing how to put it together. And, oh, I should point out, Davin, who's been on this podcast before, he has, uh, he put together two separate plans. And then he put together a thing that's out on our digital market that is both plans together for 25 bucks. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, we, we made, last ATC, we made this massive food dehydrator that was just, it was fucking awesome. Uh, everybody was in, wowed, like, holy shit, that thing is cool. Um, and so that's what Davin has the plans for, right? Yeah, Davin has the plans for that and one other solar food dehydrator. And I think you get both plans for 25 bucks. And we've sold oh. like, I think we've sold like 50 of them. So if you go to permies.com, just look for digital market and it's in there. Yeah. 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 So, um, or digital market plans, uh, solar. How about that? That might work. Let's do it. Yeah. All right. So what are we thinking about doing for this year's ATC? Okay. Uh, it hasn't been put on the ATC page yet, but we just nailed down for sure. <laughs> are you want to lead with the big thing first? I do. I go. Right, right. I go. This is for sure. This is going to be the top thing, and uh, I, I, I think I'm, I'm going to say this, and I kind of wonder, like, are we going to sell out of tickets in the next 20 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you seen that electric tractor we got, right? Yes. And and so um, I, I we got the electric tractor, and it was. Uh, we got sold. We got sold a lemon, and um, the guy told us a whole bunch of stuff. And I paid way too much money based on his word. And then it arrived, and it had three oil leaks. And so I don't know. We've got like, I think eighty hours of time that people have put into like just repairing stupid crap with that thing. Um, and, uh, and we were told it's not allowed to ever get wet because it's all this electronics. And, um, uh, and then we, we were also told about how powerful it would be like, like it would, uh, win and with, it with, it's got two wheel drive. It's just the back wheels. Uh, we were told that it would out pull, uh, a Ford F-350 pickup truck. Like it would win in a tug of war. So we were told all these things. And the amazing thing about an electric tractor is that um, 
when you mount the batteries low, it's like, man, this thing just has a super contract with gravity because they're lead acid batteries, right? And it's like, no matter what the slope is like or whatever, you can just feel it's like just got, it's just super glued to the ground. Um, and that's part of what gives it great traction and stuff. Well, you know, unless of course you mount the batteries high, which is, <laughs> which is apparently what was decided to be done on this electric tractor. Mm -hmm. So um, this thing has a bunch of problems. I mean, the, the, so the big item at the ATC is going to be to overhaul this electric tractor, to make it so that you can use it out in the rain um, and uh, to, to, to just basically give it all the superpowers that you would want. The other thing is, is that the whole damn thing is kind of like a massive battery pack on wheels. So it's like you could cruise out and then use your uh, corded electric chainsaws for stuff or whatever it is that you need, you know, you could drive it out to wherever you need to go and power stuff. Um, or if you had things around your property, other appropriate technologies like windmills or uh, water generators, uh, you could charge your tractor using that. True, and, we've, and then the other thing is that the solar Leviathan was designed to go with this electric tractor. So the batteries in the electric tractor were designed to be charged by the solar Leviathan. Um, and it's like, uh, and so basically, you know, the guy that sold it to us, um, uh, he contributed some to the design. And um, in the end, we, we made the solar Leviathan. And it's like, you hook up the solar Leviathan to the back of this tractor, and it instantly puts its front wheels up in the air. It's like, there's, there's no way this little tractor is gonna move the solar Leviathan anywhere. So then when we take the solar Leviathan and it's totally empty and we hook it up to um, our 55 horsepower Kubota tractor, uh, we can move it around. Okay. But be careful because it wants to put the Kubota's front wheels up into the air also. So we always got to get a, some weights in the front bucket on the Kubota to kind of keep it all on the ground. We can move it around and we're okay but it's like, be very careful, all right? So, it's a, so anyway, this, uh, this little electric tractor, the, the thing is, is that an electric tractor is brilliant and an excellent example of appropriate technology. Um, the thing, because it's like, not only, I mean, there's all the stuff about Tesla, so it's kind of like, okay, there's all the stuff you're gonna do on your farm. If you can use on-grid power, then it ends up, for doing all your stuff, it ends up costing like about a quarter for a tractor. Because a lot of tractor time is spent where you're stopped to do something and um, uh, you're not, and with a, with a diesel tractor, you're idling, right. you know? And, and then, but with an electric tractor, it's currently using zero power. Right. <laughs> it's, it's like, I'm totally cool with waiting here until you're ready for whatever. But, but the great thing is, is that on a homestead, then your tractor rarely gets very far away from your power source. And so it's like, okay, at the end of the day, you just come right on back and you plug it in. And, um, and so basically, uh, for a car, it's like the cost of operating a car is less than half of what it would be on gasoline. So when you're looking at a Tesla electric vehicle, it's, you should expect that the cost for operation would be less than half. But for a tractor, it's going to be less than a quarter mm -hmm. um, for a whole bunch of different reasons. Because a lot of times, too, because like with a, a, a car, you're going to be using your power really, really efficiently. But with a diesel tractor, you'll be putting a lot of power in when you don't really need a lot of power. It's just the way that the thing functions. Um, but then when you're doing an electric tractor and it's like, if you're tooling along at two miles an hour and you're pulling a light load, you're using far less energy than if you're using a diesel tractor and you're putt-putting along uh, with a small load. So <clears throat> it'll be far more efficient. So I think one of the major benefits to people, even if you're not interested in an electric tractor, 
if you're interested in anything, adding any kind of electric battery bank system, uh, any kind of electrical vehicle on your homestead, like the, the Kubota, electric Kubota would be very handy in a homestead. Um, and everybody wants a tractor, of course, as well. But uh, there are other uses that you can use this kind of electric setups. And this is a great opportunity to get down and dirty and see what works, what doesn't work, and how, to, how, to, how these things operate and how to put them together. So we're going we're gonna to overhaul this electric tractor so that way it can be of use. Yeah. Um, and, and because right now you get on it and it's scary because the batteries are mounted high and you're just freaking out that it's going to roll at any moment. So um, we're going to do, we've got a list of stuff to do to improve on all of that. Um, and then of course, operate in a, like rain and snow, like we got to, we got to make it all waterproof. We've got to make it so that way if it's raining or snowing, it'll shed the water. I mean, we don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not saying like, let's make it so that it'll continue to work when you drive it into a pond. Um, right, right, right. you know, or anything like that. I'm, I'm just saying that if it's muddy on the ground and, and mud is being flung up, that's not a problem. If uh, rain is falling, if it's just a deluge, not a problem. I mean, you know, there's ways to basically shed water that'll, that'll, you know, make it work. Okay. So, so there's all of that. So, so that's, I think that might be part of the, the big part of the appropriate technology course this year. And um, well, there's also something overall I'm very there's, that, there's a lot I'm very interested in. There's one other thing that I'm extremely interested in, but let's continue. What else do we got on the list? Okay. All right. So now, um, uh, of course, you and I and Mud have been exchanging emails and having conference calls and going over details. And so then um, uh, Fred and I put together a list of stuff that we thought we might want to add. Now, uh, what's what's on the for sure list so far? You you know more about the for sure list because Mud's been talking to you and you've been updating the uh, ATC page. It it changes. Uh, I thought we had sure th for sure things, and now we have other sh things. No. Okay, okay, okay. So it's still up in the air then. Now All we right. have. Uh, we're going over homestead tools, collecting, right. maintaining basic usage, safe usage of tools. That goes into every ATC. Like that's sure. the core yeah. beginning of an ATC. Everybody learns to weld. We do that every time. Everybody learns, everybody's gonna have experience with woodworking, but Mud is emphatic that he wants to make sure everybody has experience with round wood woodworking. So there's been a lot of emphasis on that. I don't know if he's gonna say, okay, everybody we're gonna carve spoons and carve some mallets, which I think is always the first thing you do when you're learning uh, round wood wood woodwork. Um, but okay, now, um, oh, and there's another thing I'm not allowed to talk about yet. It's not announced. It's got all kinds of secrecy. I will tell, if you guys remind me, after we go offline, I, I will tell our, our, uh, our chat people. All right, so let me, let me explain that to people if you're new to the show. If you are a supporter of Paul Wheaton's uh, uh, Patreon or a student of Permethos, like you purchased one of our courses, you get special access to this chat program where before and after the show, we hang out and talk about all kinds of stuff that we don't talk about on air. So that's what he's referring to. Uh, if you want to be part of that, just go support Paul's Patreon or become a Permethos student. And we'll get you in. But, uh, that's true. So if you go pay a dollar for my Patreon, you'll get the link and you'll be able to hear it when I say it here in like half an hour or whatever. Yeah. That's you when know. we talk about the stuff that's like, not necessarily politically correct or we do we okay. talk about all kinds of stuff so between overhauling the electric tractor and making it amazing and this other thing that i can't say just yet i want you so badly to say it and, and it is it's so amazing it's so huge i feel confident we're going to sell all of our tickets and so uh it'll this is going to be a sold out thing and uh we're going to need to go and find a videographer to come and video all of it because we're going to have a thousand people wanting video of all of this stuff. But there, there's another thing that, that I know is a for sure thing. Um, he wants to build something uh, that's like the Love Shack, but better than the Love Shack. And, and so we're going to build a porta cabin. Cool. Um, <clears throat> so we'll have another porta cabin uh, available. Um, 
Uh, I don't. I, I don't know how many of you have ever seen the Love Shack. I'm sure everybody here has heard of. It. So basically, it's it's like a little cabin on skids. The Love Shack itself was built in a day, and it's been through like two iterations of improvements. These are great uh, additions to a homestead or a farm. Uh, these, it's, yeah, it's a portable cabin. It's something you can, uh, a cabin that you can pull around anywhere you need to on your property. And I'm thinking like, these are great. If you need to, if you want to do like a B and B thing at your homestead for some passive income that we talked about last week, uh, if you want uh, friends or you have friends or family members that come and visit and you're like, I don't want these kids in my house. <laughs> like that. Um, or, or if you have uh, woofers that are coming <laughs> and you need to house some people that are going to be helping you at the farm for a couple weeks. <laughs> and you're like, these guys are slobs. Get out of my house. <laughs> yeah. Stuff. So um, uh, that's, that one's a for sure thing. I know that that mud is really excited to do that. He, he kind of feels like He's got, he's, he's just uh, frothing at the mouth with ideas about how to make it way better than Love Shack and which, build it faster. Which is a big goal. At, like the Love Shack, what it is now, it's, a, it's got a bunk bed. It's got solar power. It's got a rocket mass heater. It's movable. Like it's, it's already pretty fucking awesome. And so he's like, ah, oh, we, can, we can do better. And, and that's a, a, new, a cool thing with the Love Shack is, is that, it has an extremely simple solar power system, purely 12 volt. And it's like, if you're gonna go purely 12 volt, the whole system gets to be far simpler. Yeah. And, uh, and, and along those lines, um, a probably, so it's gonna be, it's on the list that I'm about to go over here in a moment, but a probably for what we're gonna be doing is gonna be um, uh, that we're gonna go into the solar Volkswagen which has a 3000 watt inverter uh, and it has a massive battery pack. So the, the solar Volkswagen is, on, is mounted on a trailer where the idea originally was that we're gonna take this trailer and we're going to uh, take it into base camp, charge up these, this big massive gob of batteries that are in it and then uh, take it up to the lab and use it as a power source. But its first iteration, the guy that was putting it together uh, it was great. Uh, um, he, he said, you know, right now, solar panels are so cheap, it would just be a waste to not put solar panels on it. So, okay, put some solar panels on it. So he put some solar panels. Well, now the, the solar panels have been remounted to be on a mast. And it's like, okay, so now we just leave the thing up there all the time and it gets charged and that's great. <clears throat> the problem is, is it's got this 3,000 watt inverter and it's 750 watts of panels. Uh, and, and the problem is, is that the 3000 watt inverter uh, uh, consumes, you know, a few watts to do the inversion thing. So if nothing's currently plugged in or doing anything, it's constantly consuming the power. So in the winter time, the amount of power that it consumes just to run the inverter is more than what the solar panels bring in. And so um, we need two things, actually three things. And these three things are gonna be added to the, the Volkswagen, which by the way, the, the design of the Volkswagen is very similar to the Leviathan. And so it's like, it would be cool if we could do the same thing to the Leviathan, but of course it's a class. So we do it just one time. So everybody can kind of learn how it's done. And uh, so the Leviathan will have to wait till maybe next year or whatever. Um, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna put in a second inverter that is like a 200 watt inverter. And it'll be on, they'll both be on a timer. And so it's gonna be something where it's like, you could turn the timer and say, I want four hours worth. Hmm. And so then at the end of four hours, both of the inverters are turned off. Hmm. In the meantime, you pick, do you want the little inverter or the big inverter? Um, and so the thing is, is that you know, you don't just leave this power drain on if you're not using it. So, uh, um, so there's, there's two of the three things. Is one is the timer, one is the, the smaller inverter, which of course uses much less power to do 200 watts, which would be great for running a laptop or great for, you know, charging your phone or whatever. But speaking of charging your phone, 
there's no 12 volt system that's part of uh, the, the solar Volkswagen. So we're going to add in a 12 volt system. And so that way, uh, complete with some 5 volt uh, 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 USB charging ports. So that way, people can uh, uh, do that. You know, they could go in there, they could charge their phones or whatever they need to in there instead of uh, having to fire up the inverter. Because currently the inverter is getting fired up for somebody to charge their phone. The inverter is probably consuming 10 times more energy than the phone is. Yeah. So, um, and you're trying to conserve power and stuff. So it's gonna, we're gonna improve the overall design of the Volkswagen. So that's, that's one of the things that's a for sure thing. Well, and this, for me, this is like, okay, this is going to help me with a project that I want to do, which is I want a small trailer, battery, a battery bank system in a small trailer, something I can haul around my property, hook up to windmills, hook up to micro hydro power stations, things like that to charge them, have the, have solar on it and be able to use that power wherever I want. And having those extra uh, car batteries is great for electric fencing because if I'm running electric fencing uh, systems all around my property and battery oh. needs to go dead, I can pop out a battery from my trailer and replace it and put the, the bad one back into the trailer. So part of what Mud wanted to do here was to um, put up a very tall uh, wind power station. And I think I crapped all over that idea. <laughs> um, basically, we don't get very much wind here. I mean, we're, we're, uh, this is the Rocky Mountains, the world's biggest windbreak. <clears throat> and so it's kind of like, uh, if you want to get great wind, you got to go up. Uh, I mean, if, yeah, you could go up to the top of the volcano, you know, probably get some decent wind up there, putting a, something on a big old pole up there. Yeah. Um, you know, but it's like, uh, uh, if you find a big high spot or a ridge or something like that, you might be able to do some wind power. But um, yeah. it's appropriate technology. It's just not appropriate for your area. We have a, a well up at um, the lab and uh, so it sounds like there's a desire because like the well uh, brings in maybe more than 100 gallons a day which is not much it's difficult I mean that's I, th I think that like here at at, uh, at base camp our well is 300 gallons a day um, which I think works out to be a third of a gallon per minute and and most wells are measured on their gallons per minute and I think that um, most uh, homesteads are kind of like, you know, if you've got less than two gallons a minute, you know, you've got to dig a new well. You know, that's, that's just not going to work. So, um, Josiah, are you having trouble with your internet? I'm having trouble with power. So, my, my, you're going to see a change in the view behind me once I get this power hook. <laughs> Wish I had a battery bank trailer with me right now <laughs> all right i gotta hear from the uh chat people is is uh, josiah's sound terrible because it sounds terrible to me um it, it was sounding awful there yes yes <laughs> so uh you suck <laughs> <laughs> just give me a minute i'll get started. Uh, all right all right uh the the, the thing is next up oh we're gonna oh the uh well um we're probably going to, so we got this well that gets probably more than 100 gallons a day, which is really not enough. Um, but uh, there's a lot of discussion about like how there's belief that we could get it up to 400 gallons a, uh, a day. Is that right? I'm saying a day. Yeah, a day, 400 gallons a day. So basically get it to the point that it produces more water than the well um, here at base camp and the techniques that would be used right. to enhance a well to make it so that it could do much better. So um, uh, that's a, that's been a very fascinating discussion. <clears throat> and of course, water is like one of the most, and probably it's, to me, it's the most important thing I look at when I'm looking at properties. It's like water is the most important thing. Uh, if I don't have access to water or if that water is contaminated, fuck this property. I'm just okay. not going to do well, it. Well, no. Hey, let me kick that whole thing in the nuts. Okay. And so <laughs> Sepp Holter's place is a great example. The property, I mean, he inherited it from his father. Property's totally dry. Now, is it dry now? It's, it's the, the place is just soaking in water. He's got little creeks running everywhere, right? Oh, yeah. You can add water to your property for sure. Okay. Okay. 
but but I, you know, I'm going somewhere with this. Like, let's say you buy some property and it's got a creek running through it. And, um, and you're like, yeah, I love creek. I could even go fishing and shit, right? And, um, and so, A, are you really going to be allowed to go fishing in your own creek? Right. Only if you buy a license or you get permission from the government. Now, the next thing is, let's suppose you got 10 acres and this creek runs right through the middle of it. Um, I believe I've, I've heard from a lot of people who have 10 acres and they have a creek running through the middle of their property and the government has come to them and said originally like you can't use anything within a hundred feet of the creek and they're like what that's like a quarter of my property and then eventually that went to 200 feet and then 300 feet and now um, the only reason they're allowed to use any of this part of their property is it's because it's grandfathered in they had a garden there before they were doing a thing there before. And then on the other side, there's this tiny sliver that's left that they can still use for stuff. But everything that's within 300 feet of the creek has been designated a riparian area. And they're not allowed to touch it, even though they own it. They get to pay taxes on it and everything, but they're not allowed to touch it. And so it's like, now on the other hand, let's suppose you got a totally dry area. And now you pumped up some water and you flung it around and uh, you got something that resembles a creek, maybe a pond. It's like, it's this is operating all, water. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is all manufactured stuff, man. This is all artificial, right? Mm -hmm. And so now you could even have a series of ponds connected with little creeks. And at the bottom, you got a little solar pump, which by the way, is a solar panel directly connected to a 12 volt pump. And there's no batteries. There's no nothing. It's just a direct connection from A to B. Whenever the sun comes out, water goes back up to the top pond and your creeks start to flow again. So <clears throat> it's a totally different animal. And this is basically a big part of what Sepp Holzer does is that his, he's just got a big pump at the bottom of his property that pumps it all the way back up to the top. Let's do another loop. Yeah. And yeah. so, and they call his water uh, the fountain of youth, you know, and, but of course, I mean, there's a lot to talk about, about what's magical about, about Sepp Holzer's water. So, um, uh, I think that the thing that you want to do, because, because what you, because I remember talking to Sepp about like, uh, like, let's say on his property, then, um, cause you know, you wouldn't, if, if it was a natural Creek, then the government would say, you can't, move pigs through there. You can't do a paddock shift system with pigs through there or cattle or chickens or, or whatever you want. There's, and, and then you can't, you can't go in there and harvest nettles. You can't, here's, a, here's the law. You can't do anything in there. You got it. As always, government will always make your life horrible and difficult. And then, um, and then yeah, I asked Sip about it at his place and he's like, government does, has never said anything to me. They can't, it's all artificial. I, I can rotate my pigs through there and I make, I make the quality of water 10 times better because I'm doing a rotational thing uh, as opposed to like leaving it alone where only, uh, only randomly do deer and elk come through and shit in the water and foul it and I can't clean it. Yeah, it, like, I was, like I was saying, I got, you got to make sure that your water is squared away with the property when you're looking at it. And like, for example, one place I found it was really, it was, it had a creek and I was like, oh, fuck, that means all these horrible things, um, which is really sad to say. You would think, oh, fuck, yeah, there's a creek, uh, but no. Um, but what I found out was. Uh oh, you cut out, dude. As long as do whatever you want, as long as the water flow in is the exact same as the water flow out. So I could reroute the creek if I wanted, as long as the flow was the same coming in or going out as it was coming in. That was cool. But it's hard right. to find that kind of stuff. Anyway. <laughs> I, I, think, I think in a lot of ways you're better off if you have a totally dry property. And then, and then you add the water in yourself. Because if nothing else, we, you start off like building a whole bunch of ponds that just collect rainwater. You know, you just, you just go out there and you make a bunch of dew ponds and whatnot. Now you're collecting rainwater. And then 
you start doing things where you have the means to be able to recirculate the water through solar pumps. Um, and, and then just pump it back up and pump it back up and pump it back up, no problem. Um, <clears throat> but now it's all yours. You can do anything you want with it. Yeah, uh, I want a well. When I'm looking at for properties, I want a well. To, at yeah. least for the first year when I'm getting started, getting the earthworks in, I need water. And so I'm looking for a well myself. I, I want to, we, we got to put a well in at the lab. I think it's, I think it's time to buy the well. We've, we've, I've, I've put so much money into well stuff and, uh, and afterwards we could talk about that more if people want, uh, when we get into the, um, you know, the yeah, private party. chat, a little, a little later, the private party. Um, but the amount of money I have put into wells in an alternative means has been obscene. And, um, and all we got to show for it now is this well uh, that, that gets maybe uh, 100 gallons a day. And, and frankly, I don't, uh, the quality water I've heard has been all right, but um, I, I think that the, the well is only like, uh, I think it's like 30 feet deep or so. And I'm kind of thinking like, oh, I'd rather, I'd feel a lot more comfortable if it was a well that was like 150 feet deep and it went through the bedrock. bedrock. Um, or, or if it got to a point where, um, uh, you know, it, it found a, it found a big water table of some sort. Um, because I don't think this, where it's at now is a big water table. I think it's, you know, a, a wet spot in the region, in the area. And, um, and it's just barely, it's like, I, I, the guy that put the well in, I don't think he could, I don't think he could have made it go more like, if you said, okay, it needs to be five feet deeper, I think he would have said, I can't do five feet deeper. I've gone as deep as I can go. And uh, so I think, I think that's a big part of it. But all right, we're going to improve this well. And, and yeah, this year I would like to find a way to put in a much uh, bigger well. But that's, a, that's another smackdown and podcast or whatever for another day. So with, with an ATC, there's like four main pillars we really want to hit for every ATC. And then we can build off of and add on to it from there. But it is the tools, understanding tools and, and how they work and using them. Shelter, making sure you have shelter uh, for yourself. Water, making sure you have water or can get water or build something that will get you water. And energy, that's the fourth one is energy. Your heat your electricity, whatever it is you need, um, you need energy. So those are the four main things. But we covered, uh, we covered the tools. Poopies. There's going to be, there's always going to be something about how to, what to do with your poopies. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Poop. <laughs> yeah. Well, and and um, yeah. And there's tons of ways to deal with poop. There now there's obviously some that are far better than others, but there's a lot of ways to deal with poop that most people don't think about. They, they're like, oh, it's not on city sewage, so I don't want it. Well, that's great for us because we don't want that. <laughs> well, we I, th I mean, normally what you're going to do if you move out in the country, you're going to put in a septic tank and a drain field. Right. right. And, and you're going to have a water-based thing. Um, and then, or of you're course... you're going to dig a hole and put an outhouse there, which is becoming illegal in a lot of places. But All right. But, but normally it's going to be a septic tank and a drain field. Like normally that's what you're going to do. And... Um, now, and you got to think to yourself, well, why is it that, don't, that people don't do that in the city? Why is it that wh at one point a city says, everybody has to switch over to the septic system and we're going to handle it in a central way. You and basically- The sewage system. Oh, right. The sewage right. system. We're going to have a central sewage system and everybody has to, to not use the septic tank that they've already paid for yeah. and they have to use the sewage system instead which by the way, we're going to, you know, basically rake out the chunky bits and throw them into the dump. And then we're going to um, take, uh, we're going to let it kind of settle out. We're going to try and get the chunky bits out and that leaves behind kind of a poop Kool-Aid and we're going to just basically send that down the river. Yeah. And, and it's kind of like, uh, and then there's all the industrial the aquifer for all those fucking well people. <laughs> well, and now the thing is, is that, yeah, what they're trying to do is that there are so many septic systems all bunched up that um, somehow their well water was getting funky. And the leach and, fields for, you know, there's... And, and so it's kind of like, all right, well, how, how do we all live here and not have poop Kool-Aid for our drinking water? 
-hmm. And so it's kind of like, okay, how do we do better than that? How? And then I think another thing that you don't hear very much yet, but I think we're going to start hearing a lot more about it in the next um, five to 10 years is uh, peak phosphorus. So for a lot of our food, the phosphorus is mined, mined and then put on crops, food takes it up, people eat that food, which is phosphorus rich and delicious, and, uh, and then we poop it, and then it just goes either into the dumps or it goes down the river, and, um, uh, in which, and we're starting to run out of phosphorus. So, um, okay, so Josiah sent me a note saying I've been babbling too much. All right, let's get to this list. Let's get to this list. So, you know, there's a lot of details to talk about for all these things, but... Um, all right, I, I had a long uh, conversation with Mud. Uh, was it yesterday or yeah, I think it was. I think it was yesterday or the day before. It was yesterday. Uh, and and then um, uh, we were talking about doing a couple of gray water systems. So there's there's different kinds. So we want to do something that's very simple because when you do a full gray water system for your house, then I mean that's a big project. And what the appropriate technology course is is like. Let's do 20 projects that's all squeezed into two weeks. And on top of that, a lot of classroom time about a lot of this stuff. And so that's, that's what the appropriate technology course is all about. Um, but we are going to try and do a couple of gray water systems. Um, we're also exploring the idea, speaking of dealing with your poopies, um, there's a, a space in Cooper Cabin, kind of like a bathroom-like space. And so we want to put a willow feeder in there. So we're going to design and build some kind of willow feeder system in there. And this is on the probably's list. It's, it's not a for sure, but we're probably going to do that list. Um, uh, Mud wants to do a lot of roundwood projects. So working with roundwood. And one of the roundwood projects that was discussed was that uh, to put in a little bit of stairs in front of the red cabin. So the red the steps in front of the red cabin are currently old, wobbly, not in particularly great shape, and kind of weird. Like, why did they do that? Um, so uh, there's, it's on as a maybe right now. And I think, uh, I know that last year Tim Barker was in charge of the ATC, and he did kind of like this thing where he had a list of like 25 items, and then people voted for all the items, and then whichever ones were the ones voted for the most were the ones that were done. What's great about having so many things going on is that you get to pick and choose what's appropriate for you. Like you get to say, okay, I really need to know about this because I want to do something similar on my property. Um, I don't care about that so much so I can skip it and go to this one, things like that. Which by the way, um, Mud was here for the Jamboree in the, uh, in the fall. Uh, he's one of our innovators. <clears throat> and he really liked the Jamboree format. And uh, so, and we kind of did a little bit of Jamboree format at the appropriate technology course last year, where mm -hmm. basically some of the students that kind of really had it figured out or had some skill or whatever, they would be put in charge of a build and then Tim would move around from project to project and keep them all going simultaneously. Yeah. And then people could wander from project to project and build the experience that they want with their favorite projects, as opposed to like, okay, we're building one thing and, um, and it was like, like phenomenal. Like it was high yeah. energy class. Like it was a really good, everybody felt really good about the Jamboree. It was just a lot of fun. Oh yeah, the Jamboree was, but, but there was some of it done at the ATC too, which is my point, but it was just Tim. And, and so um, Mud has recruited a friend of his who has um, got greater expertise than Mud in some of these things. In fact, it's his friend, Jim, that's going to be in charge of the electric tractor overhaul. Um, so the thing is, is that they're going to do that same thing. They're going to try and have four or five projects happening simultaneously at any given time. And then instead of just one instructor that then does laps around to keep them all moving forward, then um, it's going to be uh, uh, Mud and Jim, so two instructors you know, a lot, a lot more direct attention. So it's Jim J uh, Jakuzak, um, or James, if you're looking at him for him online, he also goes by James, I think his author thing is James, J-U-C-Z-A-K. I want to talk about these guys a little bit more because they're probably like, who, who the hell's mud? 
So Mud is Chris McClellan. Um, and he writes articles for like Mother Earth News. He's, he, he's very involved in this appropriate technology kind of things and also very involved in uh, rocket mass, the rocket mass heater. Uh, yeah. And so fantastic person. Chris McClellan. So his name is Chris McClellan and he goes by Uncle Mud. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, uh, I'm, and so many people call him Mud, an Uncle Mud. And it's like, you, you know, you might not know what his uh other name is but uh but yeah chris mcclellan also known as uncle mud and he's uh he's just a fantastic wealth of knowledge and the guy is super easy to talk to a lot of fun to talk to he's just a fun guy um and for so for him to say all right i want to bring in james or jim um as a co-instructor because he has a lot of knowledge and things that i don't or like in these specific areas that he would be that that alone is saying a lot because the idea of someone having a lot of knowledge in something that Mud doesn't already is, is pretty incredible because the guy's got a lot of knowledge. So it's two great instructors to learn from. Yeah, yeah. And so um, it's going to, I think it's going to end up being very much a jamboree format of multiple builds at one time. And mm -hmm. so um, that way, I think that uh, A, you get to have as much hands on on your favorite project as you want which is sometimes an issue because if you've got one build going on and you got like 12 students, then it's like, okay, you have to stand back because other people want to go in and get, the, get their experience. And then you get bored while you're waiting for that one to be done so you can go on to the next thing. And so with this Jamboree format, then there's usually uh, four students at each build and you can facilitate more students and getting more done um, and everybody gets to have their hands on and nobody's getting bored. Oh yeah. Uh, and, and there's then, certain, some of these projects have multiple parts. Like there's some things that you might already know, but some part of it that you don't know. So you skip the part you already know about and come in for the later part, or you uh, lend your expertise into that part. Which, speaking of which, at the Jamboree, um, there were a bunch of people who kind of got this whole thing about, um, uh, they wanted to build something that would melt glass. And so they wanted to make like a glass recycling kiln. And so you could put, you know, put broken glass into a tray and out comes a glass tile. And, uh, and that was done entirely by the students. And so the students did the design and some of the innovators would check in on them once in a while. Um, but I think, I know we don't, we didn't end up with a permanent artifact. I don't know if they actually got to the point that they were melting glass, but I saw the thing fired up several times, but I don't remember hearing any report about like getting, getting glass out of it. Well, I think we ran out of time. It was just like, there were so many projects we did. It was, it was like, all right, we're going to do that one, but it's got to come after these. Like it was voted to be done last. And we just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a low priority. It was a low priority, but um, uh, there's a lot of, uh, at the ATC, I don't know of anybody uh, taking on any projects of their own, you know, where it's like, uh, I want to do a thing. It's not on the list, but I have this idea. Is it okay? And of course, part of the problem is, is like, um, uh, you know, a lot of times you want to experiment, it consumes materials. And it's like, you know, if you're going to go and consume $200 worth of materials, you better have a final product that really does work. Yeah. Um, and if, if it's like, if it's uh, Mud or Jim doing it, then it's like, oh, yeah, if they want to do it, total confidence. But if it's a student doing it, it's kind of like, um... What background do you have in doing this? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let's let's talk some more. Let's. Uh, I don't want to just burn materials for the sake of burning materials. So. Um, All right. Uh, so if you want to come to the ATC, where do you go, Paul? <laughs> what you're gonna you you're ready to end this right now? Yeah. I haven't. Even, I've barely started on the list. I know, there's, man. You there's gotta... like ten more things on this list. All right, we'll go through the first for this. Okay, we're at an hour. So you go to. Okay. Richsoil.com slash ATC. And now I have to actually type it to make sure that it'll do that because, uh, let's see. Richsoil.com slash ATC. <laughs> Julia says, my lunch hour is over, dude. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. All right, I've got to I've got to make the ATC part actually uh, work for rich soil.
All right. But just if, go to Rich right now, if it's richsoil.com slash atc.jsp, that works right now. And I put that in the chat for you guys if you and want. I'll try to make a, an ATC shortcut here in a, in a moment. But okay. Okay, just real quick, reading off the list without any uh, – um, so let's see. Uh, the Cyclone Rocket Mass Heater needs a new layer of plaster. So there will be some stuff about plasters. Uh, we talked about the idea of building a single shell – single cell burn shed. So that would be a 12 by 12 shed for probably no cost whatsoever, but we go out and we grab a bunch of logs out of my forest, which currently has too many logs, and slap together a berm shed. Um, we got the materials for this at the ATC uh, this last year, but it was, we ran out of time. Uh, the glass recycler that w people were trying to do with the rocket stuff at the Jamboree, um, before that, at the ATC, they were going to do it with a Fresnel lens. And so we still have the Fresnel lens. It was ordered during the event. The, the students decided they wanted to do this Fresnel lens glass recycler, but you ran out of time. And the Fresnel lens came late. The Fresnel lens showed up like on the last day or something. There just wasn't time. There's too much going on already. So, but that'll be happening for sure at this year's event. Um, bicycle repair shop. Uh, we've got a deal with Free Cycles in Missoula, and they want to come and put in a full shop with tools and extra parts yeah. uh, at Wheaton Labs for reasons. There's a whole story behind that, cool. but that might be a whole separate thing happening uh, as part of the ATC. All right. um, <clears throat> uh, proper well, and so we want to put in a proper well, but apparently Jim has a lot of experience with selecting a site for a well. And so he, he's going to, at the very least, select the site for the well. It's possible we might dig a well. That seems unlikely at this point, but we will definitely at least select a site and talk about why select a site this way, in this place, whatever. Um, uh, oh, the hot water. Uh, so we've got a rocket hot water heater next to the showers, and, it, and the pressure regulator on it is a little bit odd. And so an overhaul of the pressure regulation system because, of course, boom squish, right? Don't want boom squish. So uh, let's, let's improve the pressure regulator that's there now. Hot water from the compost pile. This will be the last year that we will try to get Jean Payne style hot water. Unless, of course, it works, then we'll do it again. But we only had it like four years ago uh, for a few months. We had unlimited scalding hot water. And ever since then, we haven't been able to duplicate it. So this year, it's like, let's go all out and make it happen. And if we can't get it to happen, we're going to scrap it and not do it again. Uh, we're going to build a brand, this is a for sure thing. We're going to build a brand new first class urine diverter for Willow Wonka. Mm -hmm. So Willow Wonka is a willow feeder. And uh, the urine diverter that's in it right now is a little dodgy because it was built to be temporary. You're making this finger face and- Tuesday found- What? <laughs> Tuesday found a perfect solution for that, and I'll email it to you. Okay. All right. Well, email it to Mud. <laughs> All, right. All right. And then we're talking about putting in a sink in Willow Wonka, much like the sink that's currently in Willow Bank. Um, and so it's a, got a foot pump on it and, you know, uh, that kind of thing. That's it. That's, that's the list of the requests that I sent to Mud. And he's got a longer list than that for other stuff that he wants to do. And so, but it's Mud's decision on what's going to actually be done. So, but, but you get a general idea of all the kind of stuff that you'll see at an ATC. We hope you come out and see you there. Uh, it's going to be a ton of fun. It always is. And now we're going to go tell the, the private people the big thing that's going to sell out all the tickets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Thanks again for coming, guys. Uh, Permaculture Smackdown. Tune in next week, and we'll talk about something new. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.